Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jeremy Leffler. I work in the policy office at the National Science Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this, which is the final session of the NSF Virtual Grants Conference. Before we begin, we're going to take a poll to find out a little bit more about you. You may only be able to access this poll if you're viewing this from within the Zoom application. If you have questions during today's presentation, please submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We are going to do our best to answer your questions in the time that we have today. However, please do keep in mind that we have a lot of attendees for today's session, so it's possible we won't get to all of them. We are recording this session and we'll make it available on our website, nsfpolicyoutreach.com in the coming weeks. And we'll send an email announcement as soon as this and all of the sessions have been posted. If you experience any technical difficulties during this presentation, please let us know in the Q&A and someone will assist you. So thank you for participating in our poll. And I'm now pleased uh, to present this session, which will cover revisions to the proposal and award policies and procedures guide. And this session will be presented by Jean Feldman, who is head of the policy office at NSF. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fall 2022 NSF Virtual Grants Conference. And in this session, we will be covering the revisions to the Proposal on Award Policies and Procedures Guide that we have been talking about throughout this conference. And this is version 23-1. Next slide, please. My name is Jean Feldman. I'm head of the Policy Office and the Division of Institution and Award Support in the Office of Budget, Finance, and Award Management. And you can reach me, as you've heard before throughout this conference, at policy at nsf.gov. And once again, I'm delighted to talk about the changes to the PAP Guide for 2023. Next slide. Well, what am I going to cover in this session? Well, there are four topics um, shown on this slide. Again, as I've already mentioned, the PAP Guide for 2023. Uh, um, NSF's implementation of National Security Presidential Memorandum 33, or NSPM 33, as it will be referred to during this session. And the National Science and Technology Council has been working since January of 22 to develop implementation for National Security Presidential Memorandum 33 with the goal of providing clear and effective rules for ensuring research security and researcher responsibilities. This implementation guidance was a product of close collaboration across the federal government, OSTP, fellow cabinet departments, and other federal agencies, and in the wider executive office of the president. We will also be talking about NSF's transition to research.gov, um, as well as some resources that will help you not only after this session, but as you're preparing, hopefully, that next future proposal for submission to NSF. Next slide, please. Well, let's talk about the timeline for the PAP guide. Well, first of all, um, many of you may uh, be aware of NSF's process, but if you're not, let me just be briefly explain it to you. NSF follows the requirement that we publish um, as part of the Paperwork Reduction Act by uh, that is run by the Office of Management and Budget, um, a comment process that allows the community to take a look at what our proposed changes are before the document hits the street so that the community can provide any comments that they may have on how a proposed policy may impact their community. So this is a 60-day standard. Uh, we go and put the document out for public comment, and then there is a bit of a waiting game for the comment period to end. And yes, just like proposals, we tend to receive the majority of the comments at the very end. As you can see from this slide, the 60-day comment period began on April 13th and concluded on June 13th. We resolved all of the comments and we now have OMB approval to proceed. 
Typically, clearances are for a three-year period, but to ensure that our policies and procedures are up to date, we annually go through this revision process. This year's PAP guide was particularly challenging as we worked on um, several foundation-wide changes as well as the implementation of NSPM 33, which will, I will go into in some detail in later slides. With OMB approval and NSF posting of the document, we have given the community at least 90 days until the PAP guide becomes effective. This gives the community the opportunity to train staff and faculty on the major changes. And it gives a, a necessary opportunity to make any changes to systems or to ensure compliance with new or modified policies. So this PAP guide will become effective on January 30th, 2023, which is the same timeline that we have for moving from Fastlane to research.gov for proposal preparation and submission. And we wanted to ensure that our guidance is written in such a way that it is consistent with this major change. Next slide, please. So there are actually, based on our comment process, um, we received a lot of feedback, uh, both internally and externally, on a couple of the proposed changes that we wanted to make. And so we realized based on this comment process that there may be the need for additional time to implement some of the requirements that we've imposed. And there are two areas in particular. First is responsible and ethical conduct of research. Throughout this session, we'll call it RECRA or RECR. And I'm going to be covering it in a bit, but we will be providing extra time to implement the new RECRA RECR requirements. And those will go into effect for proposals submitted on or after July 31st, 2023. Another area that we received a significant feedback on from the community was regarding NSF's movement to mandatory use of science CV to prepare both the biographical sketch and current and pending support. And what we heard from the community was that more time was necessary in order to get faculty um, so other senior personnel on uh, at your institutions and organizations ready for this change. Again, I've got some more slides on that later, but the important point is that we have given until October 23rd, 2023, any proposal submitted on or after that date will be required to have the biographical sketch and current and pending support for each individual identified as senior personnel to come in through Science CV. Next slide, please. So uh, due to the time constraints associated with doing any of these presentations, especially one as large as this PAP guide revision, I'm really going to only just touch on the most high profile changes to the PAP guide. You'll see that in the actual document itself, we provide a list of by chapter summary of all of the changes. And we strongly encourage you not only to look at the summary of changes, but actually the full text in the document to really get a sense of what changes were made to the document. So as I've already mentioned, we are transitioning from Fastlane to research.gov. And in accordance with important notice 147, which was issued in 2020, NSF included for the first time a date by which the foundation would no longer accept proposals in Fastlane. The important notice specified um, by the end of 2022 as the date new proposal preparation in Fastlane would cease to exist. The PAP guide has been revised to remove Fastlane as a submission option for any new proposal submitted or due on or after um, January 30th, um, uh, 2023. 
And it's important to emphasize that active proposals that were originally submitted in Fastlane prior to this implementation date will continue to be available to the proposer um, in, for use in submission of both proposal file updates as well as budgetary limitations. But let me emphasize that this is for a limited period. All new proposals, again, will be required to be submitted in research.gov as of the January 30th date. And um, I will be trans, uh, uh, talking more about the transition to research.gov later in the presentation. We've also increased um, use of um, our uh, ways in which we solicit proposals by adding a new uh, type. Uh, called the Broad Agency Announcement, or BAA. BAAs are used by other agencies to solicit research proposals, and the term BAA refers to a solicitation method used by NSF for basic and applied research, scientific study, and experimentation. And unless otherwise specified, NSF can choose to fund proposals submitted in response to a BAA as grants, cooperative agreement, contracts, or other arrangements. And BAAs are broad in their subject matter and focus on advancing science rather than acquiring specific prod products. And there is more information in the Federal Acquisition Regulation in Part 35. The important point to emphasize here, though, is this is just one more tool in our arsenal in terms of how we can bring proposals or solicit proposals to the foundation. So you will continue to see solicitations be um, the uh, most heavily utilized vehicle, but we did want to make it clear that we did have this new broad agency announcement uh, vehicle out there and that uh, it would be used in areas where we believe it's most important to do so. So now I'm going to talk about um, uh, our revised certification for responsible, responsible and ethical conduct of research or RECRA. Now, what did we do to this section? Well, first of all, it's very important to emphasize that the CHIPS Plus Science Act actually changed uh, the America Competes Act in the area of responsible and ethical conduct of research. Uh, RECRA and the certification is not a new requirement, but what was the changes that were made are as follows. First of all, there is a new, as I mentioned before, a new certification for proposals submitted on or after July 31st, 2023. Uh, this certification and the prior certification didn't apply to proposals for conferences, symposia, and workshop. What is new are these last two bullets. Number one, CHIPS Plus Science amended, amended America Competes to expand the training requirement. You are now, will now be required when this goes into effect to provide training in the responsible and ethical conduct of research to faculty and other senior personnel. And in addition, the, uh, the language was changed to add three training areas that would be required to be covered in um, uh, your training arsenal that you give to all undergrads, grads, postdocs, um, and now faculty uh, and other senior personnel. And we will be implementing one of those with this implementation of the PAP guide. And that's the requirement to include mentor training and mentorship as part of your training. There were two other topics that are considered part of research security, and we will um, be handling those training requirements in another way. So uh, effective, um, on this date, January 31st, you will be required to train all faculty and senior personnel identified that are participating or, or supported by NSF to conduct research, as well as cover the topic of mentor and mentorship. Next slide, please. Now, some of the other changes that are worth mentioning to you is that we have added a new um, uh, 
uh, document or type of submission to the PAP guide called a concept outline. Um, these uh, have already been used at NSF, and now we are formally including it now in the PAP guide. Well, a concept outline is a concise summary of a project idea that contains information about the prospective PIs, potentially germane NSF organizational units, project title, keywords, and brief narrative descriptions of the idea and fit to any specific criteria required for the proposal type or funding opportunity. These are not letters of intent or preliminary proposals. The primary purpose of requiring a concept outline are to ensure that the concept being proposed by the prospective PI is appropriate for the proposal type or funding opportunity and to help reduce the administrative burden associated with submission of a full proposal. So the program officer is going to look at it and say, is this right? And then let you know via a response, an email, whether it's appropriate for either the proposal type or the funding opportunity that you plan to submit. Now, planning, rapid, eager, and raised funding types already require the prospective PI to contact the relevant program officer prior to submitting the proposal. Concept outlines are considered again by the program cognizant program officers to determine the appropriateness of the work, and you will receive an, an email that specifies whether a full proposal may be submitted full proposal submitted without the requisite program officer concurrence email um, for proposal types or funding opportunities that require one will be returned without review or will not be accepted. Concept outlines also may be submitted at any time by the prospective PI uh, seeking early feedback on the general appropriateness and potentially relevant funding opportunities uh, for um, a project idea prior to developing uh, a full proposal. Now, the funding opportunity will let you know whether you should submit um, the concept outline via email and provide instructions or via use of the prospect system. And that is something that we did hear in response to the comment process, both internally as well as from the external community, that we were introducing a new system again and that they felt it would be helpful if more flexibility was provided uh, to program officers in terms of whether prospect was used or not. So read the funding opportunity to um, get a sense of what the actual requirements are regarding use of the prospect system or whether it has to be submitted via email. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this is a screenshot. You obviously can't see it very well, but it's the entry slide um, to the prospect system, which stands for concept outlines and the program suitability and proposal concept tool. That's we had to come up with letters for almost all of them, and we pretty much succeeded. So again, um, this is one of the vehicles that can be used to submit this concept outline. Uh, the funding opportunity, again, will give you the instructions on what you should do. The prospect system or tool consists of a dashboard and web form for prospective PIs to prepare, send, and track the status of their concept outline submissions. Uh, the prospect web form uses drop-down selections, validations, and text entry fields that have character count limits to ensure users have provided the minimal uh, complete information and met the consistent formatting requirements that are based on the selected proposal type prior to submitting the concept outline. To use Prospect, you must have a valid login.gov account to um, access the tool. There have been a number of changes to eligibility in the PAP guide. 
And we've spent a lot of time on this section of the PAP guide, and it's remained largely intact in terms of structure for decades and decades. And given how absolutely critical, as we've already discussed in the proposal preparation section, eligibility is to the proposal and award process, we've modified this section by having three types of eligibility or dividing the eligibility rather into three sections, organizations that are eligible, organizations that may be eligible, and there are caveated language in the PAP guide that describes that, as well as a category that is not eligible to submit proposals. The for-profit organization section was revised to highlight the new types of partnerships such entities may engage in and that such organizations may be eligible for proposal submission. And this is vitally important to, to our new TIP directorate um, as they will be looking for these types of collaborations with all types of uh, eligible funding partners. So uh, this particular change may attract new types of um, uh, interested parties in submission of proposals to NSF. Similarly, we also have added um, additional language or revised language to state and local governments. And it was revised to permit submission of proposals when programmatically necessary and when specified in a solicitation or broad agency announcement. And again, given some of the new ty types of activities that NSF is doing, this may be appropriate to engage state and local governments in our programs. A new section was also added about the eligibility of tribal governments. Now, they were eligible before, but it wasn't clearly articulated. And so a new section has been added about tribal governments. Now, let's not be confused. Tribal governments is separate and distinct from our tribal uh from our tribal colleges and universities or TICA program, which are actually institutions of higher education. And then finally, we have added clarification to eligibility for unaffiliated individuals. They were already ineligible to submit proposals to NSF because of their inability to comply with federal wide compliance, uh, such as um, uh, 2 CFR 200. But we, what we wanted to make clear here, though, is that we do have a category of proposers that are um, not a, may not be affiliated with a given institution, and those are our postdoctoral fellowship programs. And we wanted to specify that for these purposes, they are not considered um, uh, unaffiliated. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk about um, another change that uh, was made um, to the Proposal and Award Policies and Procedures Guide, and that has to do with safe and inclusive working environments for off-campus or off-site research. Now, you may have noted that we actually had a supplementary document in the four comment um, section of the PAP guide. And that has been changed in the final version to establish these new requirements that will be implemented for new proposals submitted on or after January 30th. So for each proposal that proposes, proposes to conduct research either off campus or off site, the AOR has to complete a certification that the organization has a plan in place um, for that proposal regarding safe and inclusive working environments. Now, how do we define off-campus or off-site research? Um, uh, we define it as data, information, or samples that are being collected off-campus or off-site such as fieldwork and research activities on vessels and aircraft. And we'd like to emphasize the importance that the plan itself is not submitted to NSF as part of the proposal. Next slide, please. 
Now, what does this plan have to address in accordance with the requirements in the PAP guide? Again, this is a plan for each proposal. The plan has to describe how the following types of behavior will be addressed abuse of any person, but not limited to harassment, stalking, bullying, or hazing of any kind, whether the behavior is carried out verbally, physically, electronically, or in written form, or conduct that is unwelcome, offensive, indecent, obscene, or disorderly, as well as the steps the proposing organization will take to nurture an inclusive off-campus or off-site working environment. And the plan should also consider communications within the team and to the organization. So that's a significant change worth going in, particularly for those of you that meet that definition of uh, off-campus or off-site to take a close look at this section to ensure that you fully understand NSF's new expectations with this change. Next slide, please. What are some of the other changes that are worth mentioning to you with respect to this new PAP guide? Well, we've made a change to our GOALI program. GOALI stands for Grant Opportunities for Academic Liaison with Industry. It is a type of proposal that has been around for many years, but we made a very specific change to the text this year. Um, the goalie proposal type has been modified to permit non-SBIR or STTR small businesses to receive funding from a goalie award, meaning a small business that has not received funding from SBIR or STTR has the potential, if they meet certain conditions, to receive funding under the goalie program. Let me emphasize to you, though, that there are parameters set. No funds from the grant, again, previously could go to any for-profit entities. So this is a, a nice change for the small business community. As I mentioned, there are requirements the small businesses need to meet. There are eligibility requirements. The size of the subaward to the small business partner must not exceed one-third of the total award budget. The proposal must disclose any financial interest that the PI, co-PI, senior personnel, and or um, the institution of higher education has in the small business partner, as well as identify any appropriate mitigation of any financial conflict of interest. Research security. We have uh, added a new section to the PAP guide on research security, and this falls into our overall implementation of NSPM 33, which I will be talking about in a few moments. Um, this new section has been added to really identify what the purpose of, of research security is at NSF, as well as to highlight NSF's research security initiatives. It also highlights all of NSF's post-award disclosure requirements. Um, another change has to do with the implementation of Build America or Buy America and the Made in America statutes. This is a federal-wide requirement um, that was already implemented by NSF. It was required by NSF to implement, actually was required by the entire federal government to implement by May 14th. Um, so while there is coverage in the PAP guide, uh, we had already issued new terms and conditions that incorporated the Build, Build America, Buy America requirements. What Build America or Buy America requires is that all iron, steel, manufactured projects and construct, construction materials used in federally uh, funded projects must be produced in the United States. The awardee must implement the requirements in its procurements, and the term and condition has to flow down to all subawards or contracts at any tier. Again, you will see coverage in our terms and conditions, such as the research terms and conditions, um, agency-specific requirements. 
we have a new section on scientific integrity that has been rolled out. Scientific integrity, however, is not new at the National Science Foundation. What this section does is provide a, a brief description of scientific integrity at the National Science Foundation, as well as provide a listing of where you will see scientific integrity implemented at the National Science Foundation. Um, we also have uh, check boxes on the proposal cover sheet. There are two new check boxes on the cover sheet. Um, one is potential life sciences, dual use research of concern. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a moment, as well as off-campus or off-site research, which I just have spoken about. But this checkbox is important in that it helps um, our program staff understand whether this particular research is proposed to be conducted off-campus or off-site. So it's used for actually another purpose than the actual certification. So NSF has been working for over three years to implement these disclosure requirements for compliance with NSPM 33. And it's important to note that this is not just NSF. This is a federal wide requirement that all federal agencies are working to implement as we speak. But NSF saw what was coming when we the original NSPM 33 was issued and realized that we needed to get a jump start on standardizing um, our disclosures within the agency. And we felt it would be very helpful to collaborate with NIH on this to ensure that our disclosure requirements um, are as consistent as possible for use by researchers when they are preparing their biographical sketch and their current and pending support. Um, NSF, NIH, and OSTP in this space also co-chair an interagency working group on what those disclosure policies are. And we used what NSF and NIH started with to develop and include within the NSPM implementation guidance, harmonized disclosure requirements that are for use across all of the federal research funding agencies. What a novel concept that would be to get all the federal agencies to require the same kinds of disclosures. And so we believe that that would be uh, critically important um, for the community. There's also in the PAP guide um, a new section on NSF disclosure requirements that has been added um, to the PAP guide. And um, it's really important because we emphasize how important this information is truly to the process, as well as identify that if you don't take this process seriously, there are consequences associated with that. So let me turn to the next slide and we're going to go into more detail about what changes have been made to the PAP guide. So revision of the biographical sketch and current and pending support. Well, this, this uh, working group that was established to, um, uh, to develop a harmonized version of disclosures was also tasked by with the re responsibility for building standardized or harmonized templates that could be used by all federal agencies to collect the required disclosures. And again, there, this disclosure working group is chaired by NIH, NSF, and um, the, uh, a representative from the NSTC. And harmonized requirements were developed and published in the Federal Register for public comment separately for this, because this is a federal wide form. But what NSF has done is take what was published in the Federal Register and our version of the language in both the biographical sketch and current and pending support has been developed to be as close as possible to these interagency formats. 
One of the things also required in NSPM 33 implementation guidance, and actually via the National Defense Authorization Act of 2021, is a new requirement for um, senior personnel. Actually, they use the term covered individuals, but the NSTC defined that as senior personnel. And senior personnel will be required to certify that the information provided in the current and pending support is actually accurate, current, and complete at the time it is downloaded um, and added to your NSF proposal. So this is very, very important um, to the community um, to understand that this is going to be something that will appear in either Science CV or the NSF fillable format uh, that goes uh, live in January 30th of 2023. And the requirement, as I've already mentioned before, to use Science CV will not go into effect until October 23rd, 2023. One of the other changes that we have been made, and, and let me also emphasize, we have added that requirement because you're certifying um, the current and pending support also to the biographical sketch that that information is accurate, current, and complete. We've also added an encouragement for, for use of ORCID. Now, why would we do that? Well, because ORCID exists um, and many of you are already signed up and, and registered users of ORCID. And what this system will be able to do once Science CV is mandated, actually it does it now, but we want to increase this in the future, is if you have an ORCID ID and you use Science CV, it will pre-populate certain sections of um, the biographical sketch, um, and we would like to move this out and expand it to both sections of the biographical sketch and sections of current and pending support. So we're hoping that these pre-population activities that we're working on will definitely facilitate streamlining as well as a reduction in administrative burden for those filling out uh, these uh, forms. Next slide, please. So again, this is something that I've mentioned before, but it should be reiterated because we continue to get comments, even though it is already published on the street in the PAP guide, that the fillable formats and Science CV will both continue to be available. The certification language will be on both formats. And once again, the, certif the requirement to use Science CV will go live in October of 2023. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to talk about um, the uh, disclosures and the update and correction requirements for current and pending support. So um, these requirements are as follows. Um, and again, this is in implementation. This is NSF's way to implement the NSPM 33 implementation guidance. So we already, and you already know, because of the proposal preparation section, that you already have to submit, at the time of proposal submission, collaborators and other affiliations, the biographical sketch and current and pending support. You will now be required, and this is the new bullet that is changed, is that now prior to making a funding recommendation, Program officers will have to come out and get from any um, for the proposals that they are considering for award updated current and pending support, which has the new certification. And then after an award is made, um, already if the AOR discovers that a disclosure uh, should have been made at the time of proposal submission but was not, they have 30 days to submit a post-award request to NSF. Similarly, at the time of project reporting, again, an existing requirement, 
PIs and co-PIs must specify whether new active other support has been received in their annual and final project reports. And if yes, they must attach an updated current and pending support information um, to NSA. Now let's make it very clear that many of you may say, well, what happens if I don't have updated? It's the same as when I submitted at the time of proposal submission. Well, we are working with Science CV to ensure that you can resubmit. It'll have a new date and time stamp, or you'll have a new date and time stamp if the initially you're using the fillable format. And that way you will still be able to meet the requirement knowing that you have no change from uh, what you previously um, have submitted. Next slide, please. Now let's move on to research.gov. Um, I briefly mentioned it, uh, this in the beginning and effective with implementation of the PAP guide on January 30, Fastlane will be removed as a submission option from all funding opportunities. Well, the good news is that we feel we're ready for it. We've been preparing for it for years even. Um, and so over, um, uh, at this point, more than 90% of our solicitations and program descriptions already require um, proposal submission in research.gov or grants.gov. Grants.gov does continue to be an option. So we have been preparing the community for some time. And so we believe that based on these requirements to mandate its use, you all are already using the system and are prepared for its use. So we really have been taking those proactive steps to incrementally uh, move the preparation and submission of, of proposals to be ready for January of 2023. So um, NSF has been encouraging to make the transition earlier because we believe that a smooth transition helps both the research community and NSF, that it certainly avoids the rush at the end, which would have overwhelmed the NSF help desk, and that um, it helps NSF identify any issues earlier rather than later. So the news to you is if you're submitting a proposal before that January date, go ahead and use research.gov and get used to using it now, even if you do not have to do so. The funding opportunity will clearly specify whether submission via research.gov um, uh, is available or required. And again, I, I have to emphasize that, um, uh, and I'm just showing you up at the top, that there is the box on the right from the funding opportunity that provides you, here's the instructions for whether you have to use what system you have to use. So we're very clear about this. And once again, we are not eliminating grants.gov as an option for submission. So here are some um, important dates for us just to make you aware of so that you're not surprised um, when these uh, when you come across these. So the last uh, date to submit any new proposal in Fastlane will be Friday, January 27th, 2023 at 5 p.m. submitters local time. The last date to submit proposal file updates or budget revisions in Fastlane is Friday, September 29th, 2023. You see we are giving and preparing you so that if you did submit something earlier in Fastlane, you will have a limited period of time to finish up that proposal and get it submitted officially in NSF systems. And then the last day to download Fastlane submitted proposals and print those Fastlane in progress proposal PDFs is also on Friday, Jan uh, September 29th, 2023 at 11 p.m. Eastern time. Next slide, please. Now, I wanted to bring up some changes which were recently made to research.gov. 
And that has to do with supplemental funding requests. And as of October 24th, research.gov does support the preparation and submission of supplemental funding requests, including our career life balance requests per the PAP guide. Uh, requests can be submitted in research.gov regardless of proposal submission uh, system, meaning rgov, fastlane, or grants.gov that was used. And the functionality will uh, remain available in parallel in Fastlane for new supplemental funding requests um, until January 27, 2023. We do have a demo site that is incredibly useful in getting yourself ready to use research.gov. And so a demo site is available for the full system as well as for supplemental funding requests. You do need an NSF ID to access the site and you will be given in the demo site the PI role. You'll be able to do everything in the demo site as the actual site. However, you will not be able to submit the request and changes to award data do not carry over in the actual system. Next slide, please. Now, finally, I promised I would uh, end the presentation with some additional resources. Obviously, we have a, a link to the Policy Office website that has a wealth of information that goes beyond just the PAP guide and uh, is an extremely useful page to bookmark so that you'll know uh, where all of our policy, policies and procedures are housed. We have links to the current PAP guide, the revised PAP guide 23-1, as well as the table that talks about the pre-award and post-award disclosures for the biographical sketch and current and pending support as well as a set of questions, frequently asked questions for um, current and pending support. And with that, it's time for us to move to questions and answers. And I deliberately left enough time because we usually get a lot of questions with these um, policy updates. So I wanted to provide sufficient time to answer as many of your questions as possible. So I'm gonna turn it back to Jeremy now so he can run the Q&A portion of this presentation. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. Okay, thank you, Jean, and welcome back. And um, I know we've been um, furiously typing in the <laughs> in the Q and A <laughs> as the presentation's been going on. And I want to thank my my coworkers um, Samantha Hunter and Beth Strausser, who've also been um, answering a lot of questions. And I think in the in the little bit of time that we have left, we've we've tried to identify some topics that. Um, we we could tell there was quite a bit of interest in. So um, the first uh, and and that's a bit of an understatement there. So the uh, the first topics that we want to cover were um, with respect to responsible and ethical conduct of research. Um, and I have three questions here, but I'm gonna I'll answer the ask them each individually. And the first is um, when do when do these um, requirements apply? Will they apply to new awards or to all active awards? No, these were the way NSF does not retroactively po implement policy requirements. So it will be for all new proposals um, that are submitted on or after uh, the ju July date. So uh, we wanted to give you sufficient time. We originally talked about a, an implementation uh, that would occur in January, but we really felt that given the expansion to faculty and other senior personnel, and given the fact that um, CHIPS plus science mandates the um, mentorship training and mentorship requirement, and that would require you to think about that and how it would work at your institution. We didn't want to implement that in January, so we wanted to give sufficient time or at least some time for institutions to implement those requirements. Okay, the, the second question under the the RECR was whether institutions are will be required to provide the training and will they be required to enforce the training? 
Well, actually, if you look at the, the requirements in the PAP guide for RECR, one of them is a, a, a mechanism has to be in place to ensure that those who are supposed to be trained are trained. So that one in enforcement, absolutely. And so actually the training also has to occur um, after the date specified to um, undergrads, grads, postdocs, uh, faculty, and to other senior personnel. Okay, the, the next topic I wanted to move on to was uh, is uh, the topic of concept outlines. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a, a lot of questions lot of asking about concept outlines. The first question is really is, who is submitting this? Is this coming from the PI or is this coming from the AOR? It is coming from the PI, the prospective PI. And the rationale for this is actually... Um, to ensure that um, if it's a rapid, eager, raise uh, planning, that what they are proposing to do from a scientific or technical perspective is appropriate for that particular type um, of proposal. In addition, for solicitations may require submission of a concept outline. And uh, it would indicate um, you know, what the program officer would be looking for. Is that idea right for a given solicitation? And again, the, the idea here is that we just want to make sure that prospective PIs are spot on and don't waste time building out an idea that is not appropriate for that particular uh, proposal type or that particular solicitation. Also, a lot of questions on, well, what happens? Wait a minute. We had the ability to submit something to a, P, uh, to a program officer to see if that idea was good. You could still do that with this concept outline as well. And we wanted to make that clear. We also, it's important for folks to understand that when it came out in draft form, we required the use of the prospect tool. And based on the comments that we received both internally and externally, we dialed back that requirement a bit to say you could use either email or the prospect tool um, to um, uh, provide that information to NSF. There may be a funding opportunity, uh, a solicitation to be precise that may require, and we have had a couple that have piloted and required use of the concept outline. So in that case, you would need to follow the guidance in the solicitation. So I tried to lump a bunch of questions into one based on, on uh, what I'm seeing. Thank you. Uh, the next topic is about the safe and inclusive <laughs> research. Um, we had a lot of questions on that, and I tried to kind of boil them down into a couple of the, the, the two biggest questions that I saw, which were, one, can there be a generic plan that an institution has? And then the second part of the question is, what do we actually, what does NSF consider off-site research to be? Okay. So, and those are both very, very good questions, but let me, let me start with the generic. Well, the, the concept is one where we want to ensure thought is given for that proposal to ensure that there is a safe and inclusive working environment. And NSF has in chapter 2E9 of the PAP guide provided guidance on the contents and what should be addressed. So if you are conducting research and the plan is to um, conduct that research in Antarctica, what you might say about communication would likely be very different than what you would be doing if they were going off campus, like my son did, a biology major, and he was going off campus, he did biological research, and a local stream near the campus, and they were collecting data, so it applied. So what you might do would be very different, or what you might say might be very different for one versus the other. So how do we define it? Well, we define off-campus and off 
a site research as data, information, or samples that are collected off campus or off site. And we give examples, but they're not meant to be all inclusive. We say include such as field work activities on vessels and aircraft. So it is an institution or an organization's responsibility to take that definition and say whether there is re whether that particular proposal meets that definition. Yeah, I think the the last topic that we want to touch on, um, the you know, in in the time that we have, is on clarifying a bit of the. Um, the certification issues uh, or requirements, I should say, for current and pending support and the biographical sketch in Science CV, namely being who is doing the certification and when, at what point, and then how really can research administrators help in this process? Well, let's let's talk about the first one first, and we only have four minutes, and it's actually I want you to explain. Uh, I want to explain to you because we got a lot of questions about do we have to lo upload a certification on organizational letterhead, et cetera. The way it's going to work, we have two approaches because remember, initially, um, beginning in January, you could use Science CV or the NSF fillable format. So in Science CV, the way it will work is that when the PI, and the PI is the one that's certifying, why is the PI certifying? Because NDAA 2021-223 required all covered personnel, which is defined as senior personnel, have to certify that the information that they provide is accurate, current, and complete. So when they download this, uh, their current and pending support in Science CV, it will automatically include a date stamp of the date and time of the certification by that individual. In the NSF fillable format, it will just be a, essentially a certification at the bottom of the page. So that will come with it. And we know that that will only be used for a small amount of time until October 23rd when Science CV goes into effect. So we want to make it very clear that it's not something other than the actual certification itself, and we've made it as least burdensome as we totally can. Now, since they're in those systems to either the fillable format or the um, uh, NSF um, or the Science CV system, uh, they are going to upload those. Now, the, the way for an institution to get engaged would be to establish some offline processes where they could, if they wanted to, could actually communicate with PIs about that information. But the systems themselves are designed to capture that certification when it's actually either being downloaded or when they're using and uploading the fillable format from NSF. Okay, well, we're just about at closing time. So I wanna thank you, Jean, for a great presentation and Q&A session. I wanna thank all of you for joining us for this session today and all of the sessions you've been attending throughout the week. We are gonna put a link to a survey in the chat and we'd really appreciate it if you could fill out that survey. Um, it'll help us uh, shape future conference sessions. If you want to view a recording of this session, you'll find it on the Policy Outreach website. That will be the current recording without the Q&A is available now. We will have the recording with the Q&A up and available in the coming weeks. We'll let you know as soon as that's up there. So again, thank you so much for joining us this week. Take care and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Take care. <laughs>